as we begin to look at the fluff that comes around Christmas, there's nothing wrong with having fun and packing up toys and getting to uh, sing uh, Christmas songs. But when it comes down, we don't want to miss the best stuff in the middle of all of the fluff. We don't want to miss the real meaning, the real truth of what is going on. And the Jesus that I have didn't come here to dance around a stage and, you know, talk about the joy of giving. He came to do something very serious. He came to make it, to make it possible for me to be free from my sin. And that's a powerful thing. You know, in my life, and what we're going to be talking about this morning is it's very easy to focus on the wrong stuff, to major on the minors and let the most important things in life somehow slip. We don't want to wake up one day and go, man, I've been really, really busy and the result of that is not much. At some point, I want to be able to go, wow, you know, I didn't miss the good stuff. I didn't miss the important stuff in the middle of chasing after all the, the, frivol the frivolous stuff that goes around. When we begin to look at what Jesus did, Jesus came to become what we are. And that's a powerful thing. Jesus came to the earth to become what we are. I want to read a couple of verses to you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him to be sin for us. In Hebrews 2.17 we read, He, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers, us, in every way. In every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Philippians 2.5 says, Our attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who, being in his very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Christmas is where we celebrate the fact that God did not say, here is a path for you to find me. God said, I will come and not just reveal myself to you, but actually take on everything that we are. It said he had to be made like us in every way. You know, every once in a while when we get to talking about Jesus, you know, I'll, I'll have people go, you know, but, you know, but what does Jesus really know about being tempted? Scripture says he was tempted in every way that we are except without sin. That he didn't just take on our anatomy, our physiology. He just didn't look like us. He actually took on our limitations. It said he had to be made like us in every way. That he, although being God, did not consider that something that he would hold on to, but he released it. You know, a lot of us get a picture of, of uh, Jesus kind of being like Superman. You know, he puts on this bumbling Clark Kent kind of exterior, but really, really, there's a big J on his chest, right? You know, and... And that is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that Jesus set aside everything that would have made him godlike when he came to the earth, and he became what we are. He had to deal with the same gift set that we do. He had to work with the same limitations that we do, except for one. He had never sinned. So he had the choice, like Adam and Eve, that he could choose to sin or not, 
But he wasn't born in with a sin nature, already fallen, that we are. And you know, it's interesting. People go, you know, but how can you really know temptation if you've never sinned? I'm going, you know, there are certain things I've never done that I'm tempted to do. And that doesn't preclude me from being tempted. You know? I mean, the first time I was tempted on anything that I've done that's been sin, it was just as strong as the other. In fact, I don't think you really know true temptation unless you never, ever give in. Right? I mean, you know, have any of y'all ever been tempted? It's like, oh, oh, that's tempting. Oh, okay, I'll do it. That's not very much temptation right there, right? You know, it's when you go, no, I will not, and I will continue to not, and I will not for a long time that you really know what it is to truly be tempted. You know, we, uh, uh, I was talking with some guys, and, and, you know, and, we, and we were talking about uh, sexual temptation. And I said, you know, to date, my wife, for, uh, you know, a couple of years and not have sex, I said, that, that, that was holding out for a long time. I mean, you know, to go, we're going to wait till we're married. That's a lot of temptation, you know. And one of our guys said, yeah, he goes, you know, if I was going to uh, marry a girl without dating her, we'd have to get married before 11. And I went, <laughs> I said, that's bad, right? You know, before 11 o'clock, he goes, you know, he goes, and I'm, I'm really, I guess I'm making the change. You know, he goes, I'm realizing, you know, that, but temptation is not just, wow, it was intense. It's also, if I never give in, I understand temptation even more than the person that was tempted and gave in. And it said that Jesus was tempted in every point, just like us, and yet he never gave in. He walked it all the way to the end. And it says so that he can understand what we're going through, that he can understand what is going on. He said he's become a merciful and faithful high priest because he loves us. He became what we are so that he could give his life for our sin. And people ask, you know, how does that work? And I go, you know, I don't know. I just know that it does. And that's the great thing. You know, because I actually had a guy submit a question one time. He goes, how does God killing him get me off? You know, it's kind of like, you know, you know I, I've done some really bad things, so if you'll beat my wife, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get off for free, right? He goes, no, I'm the one that did it. You know, I'm the person that did this. How do you punish him for what I did? And I thought about it, and I said, because the law that was violated was his. You see, I'm a dad. And when I ask my kids not to do things, I don't ask them not to do it just because I don't want them to do it. I don't want them to experience the hurt or the pain that is a byproduct of that. But there's never been a time that my child has ever violated one of my laws that it didn't bring me grief and pain as well. Even more for God. And he said, if you will allow me, you ever had a parent do that? If you will allow me to do this for you, I want to do it because I don't want you to carry that for the rest of your life. I know you can't fix this, but I can. That's what loving fathers do for their kids. And so as we look at the holiday, that's what we want. But man alive, there's a lot of fluff out there, isn't there? There's a million and one things to divert us from the real meaning of Christmas. And not all of them are bad. Man, I'm all into having fun, you know? I love presents. I love all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with any of that unless it robs me of the real thing. Unless it robs me of the real thing. Man, I'm telling you what, every once in a while my wife has this statement. She goes, we need to talk. And I'm like most men. I'm like, you know, couldn't you just beat me and get it over with, right? You know, <laughs> we got to talk for real. <laughs> it's going to be a long talk, <laughs> right? You know, why? And she goes, no, it's not like that. She goes, I just don't think we've really talked. And I'm going, what are you talking about? You know, you, t you ask about this. I told you to pay that bill, you know. <laughs> Laundry's full. Why don't you fix that? Right, you know. <laughs> No, you know, well, we've been talking, right? You know, and, and she goes, no, that's not what I mean. We haven't really talked. You know, it's possible to be alone in a crowded room. In fact, it's worse to be alone in a crowded room than it is to be alone by yourself. 
to realize that somehow I'm, I'm in this great big, and it can happen in this auditorium. To go, I'm, I'm surrounded by a lot of people, but I really feel alone. I don't know that I'm really connected with anyone. That's the reason we do our 100% groups and events and those kind of things to try to, because you can slip in and slip out of here, you know, without ever really getting to know someone. And that's not where we want to be. We want to encourage and be a community for each other. But we can do that. We can, we can have all the fluff and all the appearance of the right stuff and not have the right stuff. In fact, it's in our DNA. And this is kind of a sad thing. Uh, in the book, The Righteous Mind, that I've talked about a little bit, you know, it's interesting as I was looking at, at Fluffimus, because we used it for the last series, and I thought, oh, but that one thing is really true. They were looking at, uh, in the book, they were looking at uh, this, this question, and it was, would you rather be unethical but perceived as having integrity or having integrity even though per people perceive you as being dishonest? Now, here's the thing. What's more important to me, what people think about me or what's actually true? And guess what they found out? We're a whole lot more concerned about what people think about us than what's actually true. And when they poll most people, I mean, you know, how many, it's very interesting when you, when you ask people about your ethical life. You know, most people go, you know, I'm as honest as the next guy. You know, do you, do you, do you believe yourself to be trustworthy and honest? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're as much as the next, as much as the next guy, right? Yeah. And so they ask these people all kinds of questions. You know, are you honest? Are you fair? Are you just? You know, do you have integrity? You know, do you, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then they did these tests on them, you know. And the first one that they did is a very interesting case study. They had them uh, work, and they said, you know, we're going to pay you X amount, you know, for this work and, and you know, this whole deal. And so they, they went in to get their, uh, their time cards. They, you know, they went in, they punched their time card, and it was all, and so, you know, the, the person added it up and wrote it down. Then they had to go to the cashier to cash out. Well, when they went to the cashier, the cashier was uh, assigned to misread it and give them more money than they actually made. And when the cashier gave them more money than they actually made, guess how many people said, no, you gave me too much money? 20%. 80% of the people, knowing they were getting more money than they were supposed to get, said nothing. These are all the people that said, you know, we're honest, we're ethical, whatnot, right? You know? They changed it. They polled a whole other group of people. They did the exact same thing, except for they changed it by one degree. Cashier handed him and goes, uh, and, and then would say something to the effect of, uh, did I give you the right amount? With that one question changed, 60% of the people said, no, you gave me too much. And gave it 40% still hung on to it. But no, no, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and these are all people that considered themselves to be honest and ethical. They had to go through the little thing first to find out, are they honest and ethical, right? And then we go, yeah. And, and what, what do we tell ourselves? Well, that was their mistake. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong, right? Yeah. Well, they, they did another study. And in this study, they had people, uh, they were doing math problems, and they said, you know, we're going to give you X amount for every problem that you can finish. I can't remember what it was, like 50 cents or a dollar or something, like, you know, for every problem that you finish in a, a given amount. And so, you know, so they're doing that. But what they did, they did a couple of different ones. One is the, the instructor walked out, and while they were walking out, uh, they accidentally left the answers on the table. You know, so that, you know, they had some papers left there, but it actually had the answer sheet, you know, where the people could get the answers and know what was going on. And the people were smart enough that when they cheated, they didn't put every answer right, just most of them. You know? And then they did another version of it where they, uh, they, were, they got to score their own, and tell the person, you know, how much, you know, they were, they were supposed to go, you know, and they, when they self-scored, all of, everybody cheated. Everybody, you know, I mean, you know, no, well, I mean, you know, the same percentages that we talked about earlier, you know, this massive cheating going on. And here's what they came out. They said, uh, in the cheating thing, they said, they did not try to cheat as much as they could. They cheated only up to the point where they themselves could no longer justify their belief that, of their own honesty. Most of the people left convinced of their own virtue as when they came in. 
what kind of mental gymnastics are we doing in our humanity that we can go, well, you know, every, you know, because what do we say to ourselves? Everybody cheats a little, right? You know, every, every, everybody, you know, every, everybody does that. You know, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be in that design. I didn't take advantage of anything. I mean, I almost got two of those problems right anyway. You know, that was, I was close, right? You know, and, and you go, what is it? We get this fluff going on, and we go, are we more concerned with the fluff than we are? Because when they came down to it, they said, in all the studies they did, and there was lots of them, they said when they got down to the bottom, people were more concerned about people thinking they had integrity, even if they didn't, than having integrity and being concerned about people not. One of the most comforting verses that I hold on to many, many times in my life in Scripture is it says, Jesus, who lived perfectly, by the way, and got accused of almost everything. He got accused of being a drunkard, a friend of, of the unsavory, didn't keep the, the law correctly, uh, was a blasphemer. I mean, you know, how many of you know you can do it perfectly? You can have perfect integrity and other people see you as dysfunctional. Other people criticize you. But it says that Jesus never reviled or retaliated, but he entrusted his judgment to the one that would judge him justly, his heavenly Father. How much different would our life be if every day we live for an audience of one? And we said, the only person I am concerned about their opinion of me is God, and nobody else care matters. We would be in the 20%. We would have handed that money back, even if we know no one would have ever known. Because we would have been more con con conscious of who am I really than the fluff, what other people think I am, what other people perceive that I am. You know, it's interesting, as I thought about this, I thought about the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, God is speaking through John the Revelator to the seven churches that were there. And I want to read two of them. In, in Revelation 3, 1, it says, The angel to the church at Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. Boy, there's a frightening thought, isn't it? God goes, I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you received, what you heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I am coming to you. He goes, here's the thing. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're really dead. They were facing the same stuff that we're talking about this morning. How many of you know if you have a reputation for a lie, many of us go, well, <laughs> what they don't know won't hurt them, right? <laughs> the fact that there's no integrity underneath that, at least they think there is, you know, so I'm cool. And you go, really? How long can we actually keep that facade going on? I mean, you know, eventually, Scripture says, be sure your, your sins will find you out. I mean, you know, it's going to happen at some point. But again, in Revelation 3.14, it says, The angel to the church at Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. He knows them too, right? That they are neither hot nor cold. I wish they were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy gold from me, refined in the fire, so that you're, you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those that I love, I rebuke and I discipline, so be earnest and repent. Again, he goes, you have the outward appearance of all kind of prosperity. But the truth of your life is you're wretched, you're pitiful, and you're poor in the things that really matter. You got a lot of fluff. You got all the toys. You got, you know, you, you got a great, uh, you know, facade over the top. But when you get down to the real stuff, it's not there. 
How many of us are concerned about what other people think about us, our wisdom? I am. Man alive. I mean, you know, thank you for the honesty down here, right there. A little child shall lead them, right there. But when we begin to talk about, you know, our reputation, I mean, you know, I try. I try to be godly. I really, really, really do. But man alive, I mean, you know, when, when I forget somebody's name, I'll, I'll go a million ways around trying not to let somebody know that, right, you know, because that's a stumbling block I've got, you know, and, and you know, I'll, I'll end up in a situation, you know, every once in a while people ask me, you know, say, you know, what's that verse about this? Where's that found in the Bible? And I go, I have no idea. I am not good at chapter and verse. No, I go, well, you know what? It's in, um, uh, oh, crud, I know where that is, right? No, I don't know where that is. I don't have a clue where that is. But I feel like a pastor ought to know chapter and verse on everything, right? You know, just go, no, I, I don't know chapter and verse for a, a ton of scriptures. You know, I was, I was at uh, Chili's, and a gal walked up. She goes, you're the pastor at God, why, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And she goes, I don't go to your church, but I've seen you on Channel 3. I'm looking for some scripture about this, uh, you know, because, you know, I've got a coworker you know, that needs that. And I said, well, fortunately for you, I have my iPad. <laughs> Let me look that up for you, right? You know, and so I looked up the scriptures for it. And, and, uh, but, you know, you feel this pressure. Like, you know, you know I'm supposed to know everything, right? And you go, no, I don't know everything. And Why? Am I so concerned about what other people think rather than just being who I am? Because being who I am does two things, and they're both very powerful. One is there's honesty and integrity, and second is it causes me to grow up. Have you, know, have you ever had this happen to you? Somebody exposes your weakness, and you bluff them enough to where they don't figure it out, and then you go, whew, at least I don't have to actually go learn that. I was slick enough to where I don't ever have to actually be that person. I can just act like that person. You know what really ought to happen? You know what happens to me? Man, whenever I really get exposed for, for something I don't know or something I, I, I should be accountable to and I'm not, and I admit it, the second part of that is, and I'm going to go fix that so that never happens to me again, right? When we don't have integrity, when we don't have honesty, when we lie and get away with it, most of the time we don't even go back and fix it. We don't even go back and learn it so that we can be better the next time. We, we suffice ourselves to go, if, I, if I'm slick enough and fast enough, you know, live like a duck. I love that illustration, right, you know, smooth on the surface, paddling like crazy underneath, right? You know? Right, you know, as long as I look, you know, right, you know, what, what's the old commercial, you know, it's okay to sweat, just... Don't let them see you sweat, right? You know, and so as long as nobody's catching me, I'm good, right? I'll just live in the fluff and let people believe that about me. No, the great thing about integrity is when we admit that I don't know or whatnot, there's also that, that compulsion to sure that area up so that that won't be a, a weak place in my life again, you know? But it doesn't happen when we gloss over it. It doesn't happen when we live in the fluff. We just let it go on. And so we have to get to a place to where we go, do I really want integrity? Because I believe integrity is the most important thing in our life. I believe that we can be slick and fast in the short run and get away with some stuff. But in the long run, eventually it shows up. You know, I, you know and, and people with integrity get run over sometime. You know? I mean, if you are truly a person of integrity in your business... Somebody will lie to get a client. They will tell them things they are incapable of doing, and they will get the job rather than you. Once. And once their lack of integrity shows up, eventually they don't have any clients left. And the person that had integrity all the way down the road, man, I'm telling you what, every once in a while I run into a person of great integrity. I had a guy that did some drywall at my house uh, years ago. And he did such a great job, and he did, and, you know, and, and he charged me less than the other people, and he had such great character. I recommended him over, uh, from the stage. I said, if you need a drywall guy, I know a guy, right? You know? And when I find a mechanic, 
Uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of great mechanics, but Johnny B uh, down uh, in uh, Madison, you know, loves the Lord, just a good guy. I took my vehicle there, and he gave me a quote way less than everybody else and told me, you know, he goes, you know, he goes, I don't think you need to do that. You know, it's fine. You know, you can do it with this. And every once in a while, I go in there, and he goes, you know, there's no charge for that, right? You know, and, and I just go, man, when I find somebody like that, I want to call their name out in front of everybody, Right? Because there's so many people that don't have integrity. Man, when I find one, I want them to have business. I want to refer people to these individuals. Because I know that integrity is so lacking. In the short run, you know, we can try to be slick and try to pull something over. But in the long run, if we're going to have the long haul of success through our whole life, there's got to be some integrity. And people are watching. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we went, uh, uh, we're not uh, the... Uh, uh, Black Friday kind of people. You know, <laughs> I did Black Friday in my bed. So <laughs> got in bed early, right, you know, slept all the way through. But Black Friday day, we went out to see what you all left, right, you know. <laughs> we went out to glean, you know, the leftovers. And so uh, we went to, uh, out to Opry Mills. Our kids were in town uh, from college. And so we ate lunch over at uh, uh, the little Mexican place there. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I couldn't remember the name of the place. But uh, so we eat lunch, and, and we always eat in the bar uh, because my wife refuses when it's crowded to wait for a table, right? You know, so she goes into the bar, and she just kind of sniffs around, you know, and looks, right? You know, that, they're about to go right there, right? You know, and so she stalks the table, and, you know, and then so we, you know, we eat in the bar more than we eat in a regular restaurant when we go out because she just doesn't like to wait, you know, and hold that little, you know, thing and just go, it'll light up in a minute, I promise, right? So... So we're eating in the bar, and the UT game was on too, so that was also very helpful. And uh, <laughs> not for UT, really, but, you know, but so, you know, so we're sitting here, and we're watching the game, and, and, and we're kind of doing this. And, and, you know, the waitress is, you know, she's really nice, and we're laughing and joking anyway. So, you know, so we go all the way through the meal, and we get to the end of the meal, and uh, she brings our check, and she goes, you're the pastor over at God Why, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah, I am. And she goes, I knew you were. She goes, but I didn't want to tell you I knew until after I got to see how you and your family behaved. <laughs> she goes, you were eating at a bar. I was going to see if you were going to take down a bunch of, uh, of margaritas. And <laughs> she goes, Seriously, people are watching, right? You know, and, and you go, man, how wonderful is life when you don't ever have to you know, when you've got enough, you know, you're the same person everywhere that you are, so you don't ever have to apologize or you know, worry about what's going on. You know, I mean, one of the greatest things about telling the truth all the time is you don't have to remember it because it's just the truth. You know, you'll always tell it the same way every time you tell it. Why? Because it's the truth. You start lying, you have to remember every lie, and then you have to remember the lie you told to cover up the lie, and then you have to remember the lie to cover up that lie, and, you know, it just becomes a mess, and eventually... You end up hanging yourself at some point. Honesty is so much easier. And yet, we're so concerned about the fluff and what we look like and how people perceive us and that we may be silly. You know, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me as a pastor, I'm talking about incredible, the founding pastor of the Hendersonville Chapel of this church that we merged with. That I, and I was one of the pastors at the chapel later on. But Mike Nelson was the very first pastor at the church. And Mike was not perfect. Mike had a lot of flaws, just like the guy standing up here on this stage. But Mike was honest in many areas. And he revolutionized my life because it was, it was a midweek. It was like Wednesday. And he comes in, and he's sitting on the, the, the podium because they had seats where they sat up there. And, and he's sitting there. And it comes time for the message, and Mike walks up to the, the microphone, and he says, guys, he goes, I've got to be honest with you. He said, before I left the house, my wife and I had a fight. And he goes, I've been sitting here through the, the worship, hoping she would show up, and she's still not here. And he goes, my, my best guess is she's home crying. And he said, so I had a little talk with my associate, and he shared the other day, and it was really good in the men's meeting. I asked him to share tonight, because I'm going to go home and make things right with my wife. He goes, I don't have any business being here. He walked down the center aisle of his church, got in his car, and went home to do the right thing. I'm telling you, nobody in the church went, well, I'm not following that guy anymore. He ain't a very good husband. He argued with his wife. 
Man, I'm telling you what, everybody in the place had a deeper level of respect because you go, that takes honesty and integrity to go, it'd be very easy for me to sit here and preach and go home and try to fix that thing with my wife later. But what a man of God ought to do is I ought to go make that thing right. And I need to let other people know that I struggle the same place that you do. That I, I don't have the ability to walk out even the commitment that I have to Christ every day. Man, I'm so thankful that I've made it far enough down the road to where I don't have the glaring stuff that just constantly goes, this, is, this cat is so messed up, he shouldn't even be, you know, driving a car, much less leading a church, right? You know, fortunately, I've walked with the Lord long enough that most of the big, you know, obvious stuff is, is fairly well under, under the leadership of Christ. But I am not together. But man alive, how wonderful it is to be in a community where you can just be honest, where we don't have to put on a facade and, and some kind of front, and we don't have to, you know, uh, let the fluff be what people think rather than being who we really are. Because I've learned when I am who I really am, and it shows up that it is below the standard that Christ has for me, and I'm honest about it, it does. It propels me to do something to fix it. And when I live in the fluff, I tend to think, whew, didn't get caught. And then just go on in inaccountability. I don't want to live in the fluff. As we begin to look at what Scripture says in Mark 8, 36, it says, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? And what could a man give in exchange for his soul? Man, what a great question. What would it get what would it really profit me if everybody in the world thought I was the greatest person in the whole world and I lost my own soul? Because it wasn't the truth. It was a facade. It was fluff. It was image. When we get right down to it, Jesus gave us this unbelievable example that he did what he knew he needed to do even when people criticized him, even when people... Uh, accused him of all manner of evil, even when they nailed him to a cross. And he did it because of you. And he did it because of me. One of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture says, Rarely, rarely, would anyone give their life for another person. Maybe, maybe for someone so important like a king or like our president, someone might be willing to die in their place, take a bullet for them. He goes, but God showed how much he loved us in this, that when we were still sinners, he died for us. But we didn't have anything to mark us as valuable, even the individual that will never honor him. He said, I'll continue to hold that out for them as well. Greater love has no man than this, Scripture says, than they would lay down their life for another person. Christmas is the unbelievable truth that Jesus took on not our anatomy, but our humanity. He became like us in every way. He said, I'm going to walk this thing out, and then I'm going to die in your place because I love you. And if you will allow me to be the Lord of your life, to take that gift that I've given you, he goes, I will not hold that sin that you sinned against me. Because ultimately, that's who we sinned against. We, we injured other people and that, but ultimately, we sinned against God because he created us, because he designed us, and he laid out. And when we sinned, we sinned against his other kid. I mean, how, how offended can God be? I'm a father. If my son brutally beat my daughter or did, some, or, you know, or, or did something horrible to her, how great would my grief be? Because not only do I see this dysfunction in my son, but I see the battering of my daughter at the same time. In my own home, in my own life. 
this chaos is going on with two people that I love. Every offense that happens between any one of us and anybody else or between someone and us offends our Heavenly Father because we are His kids. And He hurts for the one that is per perpetrating because it breaks His heart. And His heart breaks for the one who is being hurt because that's His child too. And He goes, I'm going to do everything that I can to make it possible for you to get back to healthy. Because if that happened, I would not only want my daughter to be healed, but I would want my son to be healed. We have a loving Father, and He looks at all of us, and every one of us have been the perpetrator at points. And every one of us have been the victim at points. And it didn't matter what side we were on at that moment, our Heavenly Father was aching along with us, and He said, I'm going to make it possible for you to be free. And Christmas is when we celebrate that. So I hope you've got a gorgeous tree at your house. I hope you get some of the presents that you would love to have. I hope you see the wonder and the magic in your children's eyes. But more than anything, I want us to recognize what this event is really about. It is about our Heavenly Father loving us so much that He came to take on the dysfunction of this world. To make it possible for us not to try to fix ourselves, but for Him to do that. And whatever you do in this holiday season, don't have the fluff and miss that truth. Don't miss impressing that on our kids. Don't miss sharing that with our loved ones to go. The most important thing about this holiday is the unbelievable love that God has for me, that He came into this dysfunction and took on what I am. And that's why I want to live my life fluffless. So we're all on a journey to be fluffless. It's hard. Man, I love fluffy. I love my image. It's very hard for me to be a person of integrity and be honest about everything because there's a lot. I just walk around embarrassed all day long, right? But I'm striving for it because I know it's the healthiest place I can be. Let's pray. Father, in all of our lives, there is the temptation to just appear and not really be, to focus on the fluff and miss the, the real important truths. Lord, we ask that as, as we live our lives personally, as we celebrate uh, this holiday, that Lord will major on the major things. And we'll enjoy the fluff, but that Father, it won't be the, the important part. And so, Lord, we ask that uh, in the middle of our celebration that you would be Lord. Father, we thank you for what you have done. And Lord, for every one of us that, uh, that just need to, to get focused again, that, Lord, you would open our eyes, that you would give us the ability to make great decisions, that we would be people of integrity, and that everywhere that we go and everywhere that we act, that uh, it would be consistent because it's really who we are. And when we're exposed, that we'll share those areas up. And if you're here this morning and you need to make a renewed commitment to Christ or a first-time commitment to Christ, and that's something you have a heart to do, as I pray, you can just pray this along with me in the quietness of your own heart. Just say, God, I know I need you in my life. I know there are areas that lack integrity, that you call sin, and I will also call them sin. I cannot change myself, but I want you to change me, to be in control of my life, the Lord of my life. And you said that you died so that I could have this life. I accept that unbelievable gift and choose to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.